Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is episode eight of our secular Bible study series. Today we get to focus on Ruth. What a reprieve. It should be shorter and it is sweeter. It's actually a really interesting book and I'm excited to talk about it and we're so lucky to have it right between all of this horror. We have everything that happened during the first seven books, especially all of the atrocities of Judges and what happens next in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, etc. gets disgusting again. But Ruth is a breath of fresh air. Surprisingly enough, or maybe not, Ruth is maybe the book, and I'd have to check this fact, where God is mentioned the least. And yet, it is one of the most beautiful books of the Bible, with actual morals and redeeming value, etc. It's a book with the least amount of contradictions and errors, the least amount of problematic verses. We're just going to touch on a few considerations in point seven today. So sit back and enjoy, as this is one of the few books of the Bible where we can look at it and see not much ugliness. There are some speed bumps along the way and I'll be sure to point them out, but overall I think you'll really enjoy this. And if you think you know the story of Ruth and Naomi, I'd encourage you to still listen because I think there's going to be some nuance here that hopefully is new to you. But without further ado, let's get into point one book overview. So the first thing to note is that this is Ruth right here. This page, this page, and these paragraphs. It's an extremely short story. And yet in these four chapters is a narrative style, a storytelling technique that I think is not only masterful, but really beautiful. I was asked during my Q&A, one of the very first questions was, what are some of the good things that still came out of Christianity or something to that extent? And my answer at the time was some of the relationships I made. But honestly, some of the story, some of the art created has a lot of redeeming value. And when you take the Christian lenses off and you get to look at the Bible for what it is, most of the time it is horrendous, of course, but some of the writing and the way of communicating information and the storytelling nature of it is absolutely fantastic, especially considering its time and place in the ancient Near East. So we'll talk more about that when we get into point four, but for book overview, here's what happens. It starts out telling us that this was in the time of the judges. So remember everything we just covered in the last episode. Remember how awful and terrible these individuals were in this horrible cycle of oppression and deliverance and then sin and redemption again all over. Bam, 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 bam. And in the midst of this, we see this story. Now, God is not mentioned at all by the narrator. He is mentioned by a few of our characters in just a couple sentences. But where we do see God act is that right now, where this family, Naomi and her Israelite family live, is in Bethlehem. And God has sent a famine. God gets credit for the famine here, as well as he gets credit for when it's time to prosper, when the harvest comes. So credit or credit is due. God has put a famine on his people during one of these cycles of oppression, most likely. And Naomi and her family are forced to do something that would have been thought treasonous and really unimaginable. They go down into the land of Moab with the Moabites. This is what starvation will do. Most of this is focused around food. There's food theme all through it. So when push comes to shove, let's forget God's commands. Let's forget what we're supposed to do. Let's forget waiting for God's blessing and getting right with him. We will just go take this upon ourselves, which is kind of one of our first problematic issues here. We go into Moab. Naomi, who is the matriarch of this family, will her sons go and marry Moabites. I thought this wasn't supposed to happen. Back in Deuteronomy, we see the Levite law listed out where you are not supposed to marry from outside. And yet both of her sons go and marry two Moabite women, one of them being Ruth. Now, Naomi's husband gets killed and then eventually her sons get killed. And so it is just her in this foreign land with these foreign women, both of whom are Moabite. And so now these three women have a choice. I don't know why I'm still holding the Bible. And so now these three women have a choice and they say, what are we going to do? It does not go well for widowed women, especially childless widowed women in this time. Orpah says, no, I have to stay here among my people, but Ruth, and this is where we get from the Israelite perspective, Ruth being such an admirable and honorable woman says, Naomi, I will follow you. Your land will be my land. Your God will be my God. So we have this foreigner making this proclamation of faith that gets her into the Israelite community. She's getting grafted in, even though she's not supposed to, by the way, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So her and Naomi are like, well, we're starving. What should we do? Let's go back to Israel, back to Bethlehem, which is funny because just a side note, Bethlehem in Hebrew means house of food. And it's Bethlehem that was having this famine at the time that forced them to leave, but just a little fun anecdote. So they're going to go back, and this is a big risky decision, especially for a foreigner, a Moabite woman 
who was briefly married to an Israelite man who is now widowed with no children. Even Naomi going back as an Israelite who kind of left the herd is going to be problematic and just being widowed alone is problematic. They're treated like the poor and the sick and the outcast. They're a burden on their society because of the law of tithing where a certain amount has to go to the poor and widowed. So people don't like them. This is not a community that respects women. We know that. We can look at that law of tithing and say, oh, look how charitable, look how ethical this group is compared to some of their neighbors. And in some capacity, that's correct. But it didn't mean that they liked them or treated them well. It was just to avoid being smited. And by the way, I realize I'm talking a lot here for point one. This is where most of it's going to be. I want to just give you the summary of this book, and then we're going to just go through all the other points really quickly. So they go back. And again, these women are starving. So we see Ruth trying to get food. So she is in a farmer's field trying to get some grain. And now she meets our third main character, Boaz. Now, funnily enough, in how this story is structured, Boaz happens to be related to Naomi. And Ruth at this time is still in her clothes of mourning. She's not looking great. She's obviously starving. And Boaz takes pity on her. And he sees her as a reputable woman hearing what she's done for Naomi. So Ruth comes back to Naomi and they get all giddy and excited about the prospect of Boaz. Naomi, knowing that she's related to Boaz, is like, hey, this is actually going to work out. Like we have the kinsman redeemer here. So this is back to that Levite law where what should have happened, and there's kind of an order here. There's a procession of it would immediately be the brother of the husband who died that would have had to marry Ruth. But it seems as if all those brothers were killed. And so maybe Boaz, as a family member of Naomi, can fill this role and that will redeem the women. That will bring them back into society. A lot of Christians like to focus on how beautiful this is, this redeeming quality. Look, we can look at Boaz like the way that Jesus takes care of his bridegroom, the church, etc. But he only has to do this because without a man, women are essentially worthless, especially ones that are no longer virgins. So the girls are excited and they want to make a plan. Let's get Boaz to marry Ruth. So next time you see him, you're not going to be dressed in those clothes anymore. Time to be done mourning your dead husband. We have bigger things to take care of. So chapter three happens and Ruth goes after the plan and she goes and meets Boaz. This is the threshing room floor scene that we hear so much about. And she just flat out says like, hey, redeem me, you know, make me right again, marry me, take care of me. And Boaz is so taken with her, you know, again, he's really impressed by her loyalty to Naomi as a foreign woman who came with her mother-in-law and stuck close to her and came into this land of Israel where she wouldn't be well received. And so he says, yes, I will. And Ruth gets so excited. She runs home to Naomi. She tells her, he said, yes, here we go. But Boaz wanted one day to kind of get things ready because he wanted to do it public and make it official. So the day comes and Boaz is like, hey, wait, actually I did some research in our family tree and there's someone else who should be marrying you, not me, a closer relation to your dead husband. Bummer, right? But then that guy's like, no way, I'm not doing it. She's a foreigner. She's a Moabite. Have you all lost your mind? So he just re- rejects this duty and probably rightly so. Again, you've got two sets of laws working. You have the laws about not intermarrying and not being with a Moab. We'll see in future books, I think both in Samuel and in Ezra, we get accounts of men of importance like kings or prophets who are going mad over the fact that these people are still marrying Moabites, not to mention the laws back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. So I get that he's saying, okay, I have this duty, but my relative who married Ruth did not follow his duty of keeping it within Israel. So I reject. Now, again, God is nowhere to be found in this story. It seems like this is the point where God would be smiting someone for doing something wrong or telling someone what they're supposed to be doing. No God here. People are working it out on their own. And so Boaz says, hey, whatever, bro, if you're not going to do it, I will. So to fast forward, long story short, they get married, they have a son, that son is Obed or Oved, who is the grandfather of King David. And that's how the story ends with this important note of genealogy. Now, there's something problematic there. We'll cover it in point seven. But it seems like the entire importance of this story is just to show genealogy. Again, it's a beautiful short story. There's a lot of interesting literary techniques at play here, but that's the basis of it. So let's move straight into point two, authorship and date. So we don't have a claimed author for this like we do in other parts of the Bible, although the Jewish tradition would attribute it to Samuel. Now, we talked about that a little bit with judges, that Samuel is not a likely candidate, based off some of the dating systems of what we see, not to mention that with judges, there seem to be multiple lines or strands of authorship. Ruth probably
probably happened during one of two other periods. Your first possibility is the monarchic period. This would have been like 10th through 6th century BCE. This would have been important to kind of show the character of Ruth and connect that to David to kind of legitimize his rule. The second option is one that we've seen for a lot of these writings is they got amalgamated and that would have been the post-exile period, which is like the 6th through 4th centuries BCE. Returning from exile in Babylon and again setting up the story, setting up the lineage, setting up the genealogy, getting ready to pave themselves away for what they were going to be as a nation moving forward. Based off the Hebrew words used here in the linguistic study, it seems like it is a later period or a later stages of the development of the Hebrew portion of the Bible. And again, in terms of like dating, these events happen really quickly within the confines of Judges. So let's move right into point three, which is historical context and accuracy. Now, there's not a lot to say here for a couple of reasons. One, we covered it in Judges already in terms of what we can know about this time and place and the different tribes, etc. Again, it's pointing to a more realistic aspect of where the nation of Israel birthed out of, which was just kind of a split off and separated tribe of Canaan. There's a lot going on here where we do still get to see other tribes. This is specifically the Moabite tribe. So we do see some of the historical accuracy there, knowing that they were in this land across and under from where Bethlehem was, and that Bethlehem was a real place at this time. And we have a couple cornerstones of fundamental fact, but when only looking at four chapters, they give no specific details on any battles or any landmarks or anything like that that can be more tangible. This is just a love story in one tiny aspect of the Old Testament. The only kind of hard data we get to compare is the genealogies, and we're going to see later in Matthew some of the issues with the genealogies, but nothing that's of note right now to discredit it. Ultimately, this is just a story within a theological tradition, and there's not much to go off of other than there is one thing, which is we get a much closer look into the Levite marriage laws and the concept of the kinsman redeemer, though we see it broken and not doing what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be by law. You didn't have a choice. You were a single man. Someone in your family gets widowed. You're next in line. You're forced to marry her. So we see a rejection of that. We see a manipulation by the women of that. And we see Boaz stepping outside to come in. So great on Boaz. That's fine. But still, none of this is done according to the law. But at least we get information about what the law was for these tribes of this time and how they handled these marital conflicts. So let's move straight into point four, literary analysis. And again, this is a really short story that we can look at. First of all, it's a short story. There's a lot of narratives in the Bible, and most of them are pretty long. So far, the last seven books we've looked at have all been pretty darn lengthy. And among their narrative structure, there's been other things like law or census or treaty, etc. And this is just an actual narrative. We can think of it in the same way we think of like a Hemingway short story. It's also focused on love, even though they're trying to bring some theology into it. This is a story of loss and love redeemed. And we're starting to get a little bit more into the poetical works of the Old Testament, though the story wouldn't be considered poetry. This is straight narrative. And its layout is really cool. So it's four chapters. You have an immediate pickup from its previous book with Judges, an immediate tie-in at the end for the lineage that is going to bring us into the books of Samuel and Kings, which are going to start changing us out of the Judges and into this new monarchy period. We have tragedy that is happening at the beginning of the book, and this redemption that is happening at the end of the book. And you have this cyclical or almost reversal in nature as you move through. So again, Again, chapter one, the tragedy, the death, the leaving Israel. In the end, you have coming back to Israel, new family, new life with the birth of Obed or Ovid. And in between, you have these really simple structures for chapters two and chapters three. In both cases, we have Ruth having a meeting with Boaz of some sort, a plan between Ruth and Naomi, and a follow-up of that plan with new information being provided. So again, in this short box of a page and a half, just a handful of paragraphs, really, we have this tight story. This is something that if you worked in like a short story creative class, you would have kind of these building blocks blocks of understanding, like, how do I want to weave my way through this narrative? And you could block it out like this, okay, an even number of chapters, an odd number of issues within each chapter, complete reversal from where we start to where we end, opposing factors like loss and then redemption, death and then birth. So again, from a literary aspect, this is a really cool book to kind of study and see. And we could talk about this in much more detail, but I think we'll leave it alone as point four is supposed to be something we quickly gloss over here. Point five is going to be our main issues. And this, finally, we get something new other than God. God's wrath, God's intervention, foe ethics and morality, the need to obey, etc. We don't have any of that. One, we have loyalty. We see the loyalty of the family to follow their patriarchal leader who has to make a tough decision in a time of famine to go 
into an enemy land against the customs of his people to provide for his family. We see the loyalty of Ruth to Naomi. This is the big highlighted one. She's willing to follow her into what will be to her a foreign land where she will not be well represented so that her mother-in-law doesn't have to stay in a strange land by herself or go back as a widow to a community that won't accept her. This is truly remarkable of Ruth and Boaz sees that. Then we get Boaz's loyalty to Ruth that even though it's not for him to do, he's not next in line to be this kinsman redeemer. He sees that loyalty in her and repays it with his own loyalty. We could try to pull out some other themes, again, kind of like restoration. I think that's covered a lot in the loyalty theme, but we see everything restored. Now, God's concept and the Jewish tradition concept of restoring, I think, is problematic. Like in Job, we see that even though Job lost his wife and all of his kids, he got more wives and more kids. He lost all of his livestock, but he got even more livestock. God's idea of compensation, I think, is problematic. Even the compensation of heaven for whatever suffering happens here on earth is baked into the theology of how we get past the problem of evil and suffering. So it kind of glosses over the very fact that Naomi lost all of her sons and her husband, that Ruth, this young woman who had just been married, lost her husband, and we're supposed to immediately be gratified in the fact that Boaz is taking care of all of this for both of them. That doesn't bring back those sons. That doesn't bring back that first love. It just keeps them alive. And yes, at this time and place and considering their station in life within the Israelite community, at some point, you don't just get the luxury of missing loved ones. It is about survival. But all of this happened because God did intervene during the time of Judges to cause this catastrophe on these poor bystanders. Do you think that Naomi had anything to do with whatever punishment God was dishing out at the time to cause the famine in Bethlehem? I highly doubt it. So everyone looks with a lens, and I'm jumping ahead to point seven here, but they look with a lens at just this story. Here's the beautiful thing. Let's look at why this story is even happening. It's an atrocious thing like the rest of the Bible. So yeah, when you zoom in and you only get four chapters and you only get a page and a half and you leave God out of it, you can finally find something beautiful, but only under those conditions. And then again, the last theme is going to be that of ancestral link or genealogy. So important to be able to trace this all the way down to David and Jesus. But let's move on to point six, reception and influence. From both the Jewish and Christian perspective, you get kind of the same reception here, and that is that of looking at God's redeeming qualities, that what happens naturally because of famine and things like this can be made right from God to still get something beautiful, this new child, this new marriage, this great lineage, that if you're faithful and kind and just and you do these things, God will reward you. And you know, it's really extrapolated from this. None of it is said so. Like we see God cursing and blessing and taking credit for so many things, but in Ruth, these things just happen. But ideally, what we're supposed to see or what the Christians and Jewish traditions see is a God who takes care of his people, who can use someone like a widow from a foreign land and a basic farmer to bring about something so powerful, the line of David. This is the spin on the Old Testament people. It doesn't matter how ineffectual you are, how weak, how small, how bad, how horrible, God can use you for whatever purpose he wants. And this story is definitely added into that category. Due to the emotional depth of the story, there's definitely been illusions passed down since of Ruth being a character of virtue. Ruth becomes one of the few women that is recognized and promoted in the Bible as a good thing. With an art, she's been depicted in so many scenes as, again, kind of this before Mary figure of virtue and feminine quality within the religion. Even in her name itself being passed down, Ruth means friend or companion, and it's based off of this story. So all of those people who have tried to keep biblical names in their families and have named their daughter Ruth, it has been after this virtuous, kind companion figure. On an interesting note that we didn't cover, Naomi, when she gets back to Israel, actually changes her name to Mara or bitterness. She does so because she believes all of this has happened to her as a curse from God. And of course she believes that. It's funny, like when I've heard this preached from the pulpit, it's always how silly of her to think this. She has no idea what God's about to do for her. Like, no, 100% all of this happened because of God's wrath. Now, because of it was at her or not, or she was just an innocent bystander who got caught up in his wrath. But the very fact that they left, that the famine happened, that the wars happened where she lost her children, etc. Like all of this is one 100% evident that in some capacity, since God is taking credit for these things, she was cursed by God here and changed her name appropriately to bitterness. So we also have this kind of unique look between Naomi and Mara with the bitterness and then Ruth with the companion and friend. But enough of all that. Let's move into what will be most likely our quickest point seven ever. There's almost no contradictions. The only thing to really point to, and I've already kind of alluded to 
to it as we've gone through this is just, did this follow the law? Now, people didn't have to follow the law, of course, but then they would have received punishment. So the kinsman redeemer, the Levite law of marriage, did not happen as it was supposed to. This family left Israel in a time of famine to go to a foreign land. They were not supposed to. They intermarried with the Moabites. They were not supposed to. And yet all this gets put together as this redeeming family that God blessed by putting them in the lineage of David and Christ. It's just inconsistent in nature. There are misconceptions about taking this too literally, but we almost have to take it literally because we're supposed to believe this genealogy. The story looks extremely man-made, right? It looks like just great plot development devices. So we could just take it as this story that was crafted, but we can't. We have to take it literally if we get the genealogy in the last verse. So there's some issues there trying to make all of that work. But overall, this is a pretty okay book. We can root for these characters. A farmer that sees a woman in need, a woman who cares about her mother-in-law and follows her into a hard land to do hard things. Again, like I said, I think it's a breath of fresh air. To me, the irony of all ironies is that this is the book that contains God the least, and we finally see more morality in it than any book where God has been directly involved. Do with that what you will. That's all I have to say for Ruth. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. I've got a fun video for us on Saturday comparing atheism with idolatry. Just a quick Saturday short there that I'm really excited to share with you. So stay tuned for that. And then lastly, I just want to mention again, I do have a Patreon. You'll see in the description below everyone who signed up so far. And as the screen closes out here, I'm going to read off and show the names of some of the upper tier people who have contributed as well. And I just want to say thank you. That's all I have for today, though. Thank you so much. And until next time, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tier patrons, Sean Skaggs and Jason Rollins for their incredible generosity and also thank our secular scholar patron. All other patrons are listed in the description of each video. Please consider joining this great group if you enjoy these videos or believe in my mission. Thanks and have a great day.